Welcome back to the Infinite Franchisee Show. I have a treat for you today. We will be speaking with the premier franchisee attorney in the country, Robert Zarco. And he has a lengthy and illustrious career that we'll be talking about as well as some of his big wins. But one of the things I wanna share with you right out of the gate is that he will be the keynote speaker at our inaugural SWAG conference being held right here in St. Louis, April 18th through the 21st, the only conference where franchisees can get the business education and development they need to scale to their dreams of sanity, wealth, and gratitude. Welcome, Zarko. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you, April. So looking forward to having a nice and wonderful conversation with you today. Well, that's all we ever have when we're together, I believe, is nice and wonderful conversations. So I'd love for our audience just to get to know you. And I mean, there is so much to share. You have such an interesting background that got you to where you are today. So I'd love to start at the beginning and give us some of your um, highlights of how you started this career path. Well, <clears throat> well, if you want to really understand who I am as an individual, I think we need to go way back. I was born in Cuba, came to this country when I was two years old. Uh, my parents came in uh, about three months after I came in with my six-year-old brother. And I was, like I said, two years old. Uh, we obviously had no money. Uh, so we lived a very, very tough life as immigrants in this country. Uh, when I was seven years old, I had realized just by observing how, how hard my parents worked to help support the family. My father had three jobs. He was a certified public accountant in Cuba. My mom was a a registered pharmacist uh, in Cuba, but neither of them could practice their trade here in the United States because they did not have the requisite licensing. Mm -hmm. So my father ended up having to work at three different factories making 60 cents an hour. And my mom was working for about uh, 80 cents an hour taking care of kids uh, so that they could uh, put food on the table. Me seeing that work ethic at this tender age of seven years old, believe it or not, I decided I was gonna start a business. <laughs> and I started a landscape business, started a landscape business, but I didn't have a lawnmower. So I went to the to the 12 year old kid across the street who did have a lawnmower, said, you know what? I'm going to lease from you your lawnmower. Now, I didn't use the word lease because that's something that would not have occurred for 20 more years. But I said, how about if I pay you a dollar? I pay your lawnmower a dollar and I make a dollar and we get into business together to start a landscape business. He had no idea what I was talking about. All he cared about was see how much candy he could buy. <laughs> and to make a long story, story short, I started that business. <clears throat> and by the time I was 15 years old, which is now about uh, oh, 45 years ago, I had put in the bank, saved over uh, $52,000, which if you look at that amount of money today, it's over a million and a half dollars by the age of 15, at which point I then went ahead and, and bought a condominium, a two bedroom, two bath condo by the age of 18 on the water with a swimming pool. And I rented it out. I was a landlord from the age of 18 till about 22 while I was attending uh, Harvard uh, as an undergrad uh, with a majoring in economics, uh, did well there. When I, went to, when I went away to college, I finally shut down my landscape business. Poo poo, I should have thought better that I should have sold the route because it was making a lot of money. Uh, but then again, that was not bad for a young guy. Yeah, I would say so. I think that you did pretty well by the age of 18 and then became a landlord. I mean, it's hard to believe back in the day that anyone would really take an 18 year old seriously as a landlord, but no one has ever accused you of not being able to be taken seriously. So I know that I know that was an easy transition. Well, the reality is I had a re really nice two bedroom, two bath apartment on the water um, with a swimming pool and a great view. So I wasn't really selling myself as much as I was selling, you know, the use of that apartment. <clears throat> so I ended up selling it a few years later, made a nice profit. Uh, and at this point, I had then graduated from Harvard and I went to work for General Motors uh, in New York in their executive management training program. I did that for about uh, 18 months. And during that 18 months, I got promoted 12 times, stayed with General Motors for another year and a half. And after three years, I said, you know what? Uh, I've been in, uh, now in New York three years. I was getting my MBA in finance and, and economics uh, and accounting, excuse me. And I said, you know what? Uh, this corporate America deal is just not for me. 
Uh, every time I had a wonderful idea, it was my boss's idea. And every mm -hmm. time I had an idea that wasn't so great, it was my idea. And I said, I need to do something that makes me a little more independent, at which point I said, I'm going to go to law school. And I applied to one law school, uh, University of Miami. I wanted to come home. I had been four years in that brisky cold weather in Boston and another three years in New York. And I said, I'm heading to South Florida. <laughs> So that's what brought you back to um, the warm weather was uh, coming back for law school. Yes, absolutely. I came through back to law school here in Miami. My whole family was here. I love South Florida. I mean, I love the weather. I love the environment, love the people and love the, the activity and the entertainment that we live with every day. So I did that, went to law school and uh, did well, worked at, at a lot of wonderful law firms. Uh, throughout my law school career. It's the only time in your legal career that you can actually change jobs every three months and no one call you unstable, but rather you're doing it at natural breaking point. So I did that and uh, realized that I wanted to be a commercial trial lawyer, at which point I graduated uh, from law school. I went to work for a wonderful uh, commercial litigation firm uh, as a trial lawyer. Uh, start, did some personal injury work, did some divorce work, but naturally gravitated to what was consistent with my undergraduate economics and accounting degree. And I became a commercial trial lawyer. And I did that for uh, five years, four years in the first law firm. And then as a result of a unique situation that occurred in the family, uh, where I was a, a, a bit of a victim of a Ponzi scheme, I was compelled to leave that job and go to another job because the financial compensation was so much greater that I went to work for another law firm and it was a horrific experience. Oh. Uh, I was making double the amount of money I was making before, but the people that I was working with were not necessarily people that I admired or respected and their values in terms of the relationships between the law firm and the client was not what I always valued and what I always aspired to in terms of what a lawyer should really do in terms of establishing a personal yet professional relationship with their clients. And it became so, so uh, uncomfortable for me to stay there that I said, you know what, if I go work for another big law firm, and I had all kinds of offers being thrown at me to head the litigation departments of some of the major law firms in town. And I said, you know what, I want to get back into the same thing. I have a very distinct view of what a a lawyer client relationship should look like. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start my own law firm. And I started back in 1991, my own law firm of uh, it was called Zarco and Associates at that time. Okay. So 91, that, I was curious as to when this, your current iteration started. I'm, we'll call it Humble Roots. It's obviously grown. You've had partners added and many associates since then. Quite a, a prominent career in making a name for yourself with your own firm. When did it change from just commercial litigation to a concentration <clears throat> in franchising? Actually, the concentration in franchising started uh, with uh, three franchise cases while I was at the law firm okay. uh, that I was not happy at. Um, and in fact, you know, you look back in life at things that you consider to be obstacles and and, and things that got in your way that that created a, a difficult you know path or a difficult you know rocky road uh, and, and wondering you know what is the impact that that's going to have on your career and I will tell you uh, if it was not for the Ponzi scheme I would have never left the first law firm that I loved dearly if it was not because the second law firm had lawyers in it that were in my view uh, operating on a very gray area of the law and not taking care of the clients in the manner that I thought was appropriate, I would have never left there. Had I not le ever left there, I would have never started my firm. And had I never started my firm and run the firm the way I do, would I ever be in the position that I am in uh, and have been in to be able to have a substantial uh, overwhelming impact on an industry? And the industry being the franchise industry, which I started with, uh, with uh, three Burger King cases in 1988, uh, 89. And the, one of the most prominent one, or should I say the most prominent one, was a case called Sheck versus Burger King. 
And that was a case in which a franchisee who had a very profitable Burger King uh, off of Highway 93A on the Massachusetts Turnpike uh, with an exit heading to the Berkshires um, had his business uh, intercepted, if you may, by Burger King placing another Burger King on the highway just before the exit. And when it did that, it, it was a tremendous cannibalization of sales, otherwise known as encroachment in our business. And the transfer of sales from his Burger King on the exit to the one on the highway was so great that the business went bankrupt. Oh. And, and when it went bankrupt, he had filed for bankruptcy. The case ended up in South Florida as a result of a venue and jurisdiction provision, uh, which uh, required that the case be fought in Florida. It ended up on my lap in my uh, second law firm, the one I was unhappy with. And I felt really bad. I mean, really, really bad for this franchisee because it burst my bubble in my mind uh, as to what I thought was a true franchise or franchisee relationship. Roll back when I was mowing lawns and had my landscape business, I knew about money. You have to understand, I started making money at the age of seven. And I'm not talking about a dollar here, a dollar there. I mean, I was making $16 an hour when I was 10 years old. And that was 50 years ago. Uh -huh. So you can imagine what we're talking about. So I knew money. And when I uh, was young and saw the number of people that were standing in line to go visit Burger Kings and McDonald's and say, wow, one day I want to own a Burger King or a McDonald's because I want to be a very wealthy man. Roll forward 20 years later, and I get a case where a franchisee is financially decimated as a result of a company um, placing a competing unit in close proximity to an existing location. At which point I said, wait a second. If this is happening right under my nose, there have to be many other people in this country that are experiencing all kinds of adverse business consequences at the hands of unscrupulous franchisors. At which point, when I had this case come before me, I wanted to um, take particular action, legal action, make certain allegations in the, in the lawsuit in terms of how I believe the case should be prosecuted. But my senior partners thought I had no case that the language in the franchise agreement was so one-sided that I was never going to win and that I was spinning my wheels. And every time I wanted to amend the complaint, change the causes of action and the legal theories, I was always met with a, no, you're wasting your time. You know, go work on other cases that are really making us money because this client owes us, I remember the number, $32,000 in legal fees. And the firm was doing well. And I said, guys, we got to help this guy. This is a problem. No sympathy, no empathy. So when I ended up leaving the firm, uh, the senior part of the law firm literally threw at me the file of this Burger King franchisee, Steve Sheck, and said, oh, by the way, you can take this worthless piece of bleep case with you. And I well, took the he, case. He did you a favor, I'd say. Yes, he did. He did. I tell you, between the Ponzi scheme and then this law firm doing what it did, and giving me that worthless piece of case, uh, you know, crap case uh, to take, uh, it really was the catalyst for my entire career, at which point I take the case, I revise it, I amend the complaint, I make allegations of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, and against all odds, I win a landmark decision in front of federal judge William Hoover, may he rest in peace, who was able to see the light, was a progressive thinker and understood that just because a franchisor did not claim or a franchisee did not claim an exclusive territory did not mean that a franchisor could so unscrupulously place a competing business in a location that would decimate a franchisee's ability to earn a livelihood. In other words, interfere with the ability of the franchisee to earn the fruits of the contracts. And as a result of that opinion that came out on a summary judgment, uh, I was able to take this case that my partners thought was worth, you know, no more than $50,000 and uh, ultimately ended up sell, uh, settling it for millions of dollars. And uh, the decision, I thought, now as I look back, you know, I was pretty smart for a young guy to have gone ahead and relied on old fashioned fax machines and fax cover sheets 
and took the judge's order and spread it and canvassed the country's media, uh, both in the, in the uh, newspaper media, magazines, business magazines, television, news stations. And frankly, overnight, my practice just exploded. Um, immediately, I got a McDonald's case, and I got a Dunkin' Donuts case, and I got a Taco Bell case, and I got an Arby's case, and it just and it just became a wave of business. And I was loving it, obviously, because I was starting the law firm. The financial injection that came in from that uh, first big Burger King case was wonderful to help establish a, fi- a wonderful financial foundation for my law firm. And I immediately started growing and adding lawyers because the amount of business that was coming in was really extraordinary. But I was becoming increasingly upset because my my positive you know, view of franchising was being crushed, seeing the number of franchisees that had been experiencing all kinds of uh, legal and financial turmoil at the hands of franchisors that were letting their own selfish greed make decisions of which in essence caused the demise of many of these uh, franchisees. So anyway, you know the rest of the story with a series, a number, many uh, legal precedents in many cases, many of which major law firms in this country said to me, there is no chance you're going to win this case. I was laughed at. Franchisors just called me the crazy lawyer in South Florida, uh, thinking that I had no idea what I was doing, but yet I was winning and I was winning and continuing to win. And today, you know, our law firm is proud to say that we represent franchisees from over 550 different brands, 23 countries, 44 states. We believe it's the largest franchise practice in the world. Uh, We don't know anyone who comes anywhere near in terms of the number of cases, nor the amount of success that we have achieved, you know, doing the right thing, uh, April. And, And that's what's nice. It's not only about winning and and the winning of the money. You know, I think, you know, I've done extraordinarily well. I I mean, I could have retired 15 years ago and uh, I don't because I have a love for the industry. I've become very, very involved in testifying in over 17 different state legislatures. I've assisted in in writing, you know, legislative bills that have been introduced in different states. Um, I'm being asked now to testify before a couple of new um a couple of states on behalf of a few new bills that are being rolled out. <clears throat> I'm thoroughly involved in joint employer issues, vicarious liability issues, um, all kinds of labor issues and the impact that the raising of hourly rates has not only on the laborers, but the franchisees and the franchisor. I'm, I give speeches on all sorts of topics, including why joint employer is a wonderful thing for franchising and a even more wonderful thing for franchisees, contrary to what franchisees are being told by franchisors, because frankly, the reality is that franchisees are found to be liable uh, to a customer or an employee that is impacted by the manner in which the franchisee is running the business. The reality is that the franchisee has done what it has done whether it used the products it has used or built the store the way it did or created the dangerous condition was all at the, as a result of the mandates and directives that the franchisor imposed. And because of the overwhelming control that the franchisors are exhibiting and, and mandating in terms of the methods and processes under which a franchisee is supposed to operate the business and support the brand, That's why on a case by case basis is why franchisors are getting hit and tagged and deservedly so with joint employer. And these are just all, you know, one of many, many kinds of issues that I'm involved in and continue to be involved in. So where do you see the franchising industry going um, from, from the days of where you really started to be inundated with cases, right. And, and creating the, um, good faith and fair standards are fair dealing precedent that has been used now, not just by yourself, but by others in the industry um, to advocate for franchisees. Do you think things are continuing are like getting better for franchisees or is there like the the fight continues and, and getting um, 
more one-sided on the side of the franchisor? April, that's a very complex question. <clears throat> and it's complex because it has so many different dimensions. Um, franchise systems and, and franchise relationships have evolved over time. Remember, I've been doing this now for 35 years. Um, and I have seen it where the founders of these franchise companies, you know, are so protective of their baby that, you know, was born and they raised in, in the, in the cradle and in the, you know, the, the little, um, whatever baby bath, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. kind of thing. And, and they've you know, nurtured this baby. This is their baby, you know, whether it be a Dave Thomas, whether it be a Ray Kroc, whether it be a Jim McLemore, whether it be, you know, uh, Dave from, from Wendy's. And those businesses were built and were developed based on relationships. And the franchisor was very, very involved <clears throat> in making sure that the franchisee would prosper. And the franchise agreements as written were relatively fair. They were, they were pretty much equal in terms of, listen, this is our responsibility. This is your responsibility. It's our brand. You know, it's our mousetrap that we invented. It's our system. And then as long as you follow our system and protect the brand and provide the services and the products at the level of the quality that we expect, you're going to make money. We're going to make money. You're going to pay us some royalties to use our brand that's, that's ours and you'll, and you'll help us with the marketing and things of that sort. Well, a lot of the provisions in the franchise agreements that existed and were inserted many years ago were inserted by the franchisors as a shield to protect the franchisor from liability. In the event the franchisee who's supposed to be supposedly an independent contractor would act in a manner that's outside uh, the system in terms of whether or not they took action that was unauthorized. But what's happened is that many of these provisions that were born as shields to the franchisor, if improperly used, but deliberately, can actually become a sword that a franchisor can use for its um ability to grow and expand and at the expense of the franchisees. If I give you, you know, an example, years ago, franchisees would be contributing to a marketing fund and the franchisor would say, hey, wait a second. And the franchisor would take the, the money and they would, you know, go ahead and um, advertise and market in the manner they deemed appropriate in, in the various markets to make sure that everyone that contributed to the marketing fund would receive a benefit. Well, of course, you get some franchisees that are never happy about anything and they think it's a perfect science. And imagine perfect science. You have some, you know, uh, advertising promotional piece. How many people did it actually reach? Who heard it? Who didn't hear it? It's not a perfect science. And, and over the years, it's become more sophisticated. But back then it wasn't. So franchisees were suing franchisors saying, hey, I donated or contributed 5% of the marketing fund. Uh, and yet I'm only getting 3% benefit. Mm -hmm. So you see how the franchisee says, I have a case. So the franchisor said, you know what? Let me put a provision in the agreement that says, uh, franchisee acknowledges that to the extent that they contribute to the marketing fund, franchisee cannot expect that they're going to receive a direct benefit from the advertising and marketing fund uh, that is commensurate to or, or proportionate to the amount that they paid. Right. Okay, that protects the franchise or from that scrupulous franchisee. That was the shield. But now it became a sword. What does the franchise or do? Takes that marketing fund and decides that they're going to shift most of that money to corporate owned markets or markets that they wish that they want to sell or refranchise mm -hmm. to, to unsuspecting franchisees. But no franchisee oh. wants to buy a corporate store that's not doing well. So what does a franchise or do? pump and dump. They pump marketing dollars into that market where the franchisee is going to be looking to buy corporate stores. Corporate store sales go up, but they are unnaturally uh, inflated. Franchisee buys, the unsuspecting franchisee buys those corporate stores. Franchisor then shifts those marketing dollars 
to other markets and what happens to that new unsuspecting franchisee. Sales plummet back to what their prior levels were. And now that original uh, shield of a provision on marketing dollars being not being proportionate to the amount of advertising you're going to receive has now become a sword for a franchise or to take advantage. And like that, there are many, many provisions that I could talk to you in subsequent shows uh, to get into more detail. The bottom line is that what is the real worry, the real worry, and I, and I remember giving speeches about this six, seven years ago in front of very large groups, and everybody's complaining about how the franchisor was not being fair and the franchisor was taking advantage. And I remember saying very clearly, most of you think that your franchisor is your enemy. First and foremost, that's not a blanket true statement. That is not true. There are many franchisors that are good. Not all of them are stellar. Not all of them operate, you know, in the in the best manner. Some of them just make bad business decisions. But generally and overall, you typically try to think that they're trying to do the best thing for the system. What I said in those speeches was, if you're concerned about the franchisor, just wait till you meet private equity. Yeah. When private equity comes in, it's going to shake your boots because now protecting your baby, the fun, the founder of the companies are either, you know, have either passed away, have retired or have sold their shareholder interest in control of the company to private equity that all they care about are dollars and cents and financial return and return on investment to their shareholders or investors. And, and that, that really, and that's from the franchise or entity value point, not the individual unit value point. A hundred percent, the a hundred percent, but the individual units are used as the vehicle in order to increase the equity value of the investor in the franchisor. We all know that private equity um, measures the financial viability of a prospective um, seller, if you may, uh, a takeover company by the amount of net income or EBITDA. And then when they buy it, they take a multiple of that EBITDA and then that's what they pay for the market. As a result of the extraordinary amount of money, what we call the M1 money supply, that's gone into this country during the last five years, there has been with PPP money and all these trillions of dollars going into the market, you have so much cash chasing such few products because there's a crunch. You have an excess amount of dollars and a compressed amount of supply. And the old basic supply and demand will tell you that there's going to be a lot of more money paying for something that's worth because there's so much money available and there's such little supply. Mm -hmm. So what happens at, at, at that point is that the franchisor uh, that is being sold to the private equity, the private equity comes in and says, how can we increase that net income? And once they buy, let's say they buy, you know, a, uh, hundred million dollar net income at eight times multiple, they pay 800 million. Now, in order to get an investment, they have to increase that hundred million to 200 million. And then once the net income goes up higher, the multiple increases because the quality of those dollars improves by other measures they put in. How do you increase the net income? One, raise revenue. If you, how do you raise revenue? Grow more stores, raise prices, make sure the franchisees gross revenues go up. You may say, well, that's great. Not necessarily. If there's very aggressive marketing and pricing discounts, which increases gross revenue, it pinches the profitability and unit economics of the particular locations. So one way is to increase revenue by expanding the stores. And if you expand the stores, what are you going to deal with? Encroachment, cannibalization, too many stores in a particular market that may already be saturated. So that's one way. The other way of increasing that income is to reduce expenses. So how do you reduce expenses? Go into the GNA, the general and administrative expense, and cut the GNA. 
What do you do? What do you mean by cutting the GNA? Remove a lot of the support staff. Get rid of the support staff. You don't need to have so many support people. We don't need to visit stores as often because every time you cut somebody's $100,000 salary on a multiple of eight, you've increased the value of the company by $800,000. Because remember, it's a multiple. And if now the company is doing 200 million instead of 100 million in that income, the multiple is no longer eight. Now it's 15. Right. And the multiple is 15. You cut one employee of $100,000 salary. It raises the value of the company by one head, one head being rolled by one and a half million. Now, imagine when you have a large company that has a lot of employees. So all of this is a direction that in the future, uh, well, the future is pretty much in the present right now. It's yeah. only going to get worse. And there's many other reasons it's going to get worse. Uh, we're going to see that your next iteration of your franchise agreements are going to become more and more restrictive, more and more uh, cost conscious in terms of the benefit to the franchisor and less services. Well, and that's really why franchisees, both those that are looking at either purchasing their first location or expanding into locations or expanding, diversifying into brands, need to really be educated on this area of their businesses. I think so many times franchisees, you know, they jump into franchising and look to their franchisor to, to provide all of the education and support they're going to need. And they're so concentrated on the daily operations that they're not really aware of these other threats that are potentially coming down the pipe um, in regards to, you know, what's happening in the economy, what's happening in politics, what's happening in your brand, what, you know, is your brand looking to be acquired by private equity? If that happens, what does that mean? Like that's for a lot of franchisees out there, they just have blinders on to even this world at, and how it can really be um, significantly impactful on their businesses. The world of private equity, April, is very sophisticated. It requires a tremendous amount of financial and accounting and economic knowledge. I happen to have that. Mm -hmm. That is the reason why I understand it so well. But what's going to happen is that these new moves that the franchisor, through the direction of the private equity companies, which is the tail wagging the dog, is going to cause is that it's going to create a situation where the equity that the franchisee has built in their business is going to get either substantially compressed or get to a point that will be eliminated. What, you know, your store, your business is worth only as much as someone is willing to pay for it. That's where the equity comes in. But what semi-intelligent prospective franchisee is going to buy your business knowing that the next iteration of the contract or even the provisions in the existing contract are such that a franchisor can come in and buy your business out at any time they want at a pre-selected or predetermined formula or that the franchisor says that if you're going to sell your business, let's assume you have five stores. All right. And, and by the way, nothing I'm saying is speculation. Everything I'm telling you is, is, situations that I'm living or have lived or I'm in the middle of. So you own five units of a particular brand and you say, you know what? I'm going to sell my five units for $5 million. Let's just use round numbers. And then the buyer says, you know what? Okay, I'm going to pay you the 5 million. Great. You're happy. They're happy. Forget the fact that now the franchisor has to grant consent to the transfer and, and think about every possibility as to why they may not do it for their own selfish interest, which is another conversation. But the franchisor goes to the prospective buyer and says, okay, we'll approve you on the following condition. We'll let you buy these five stores if you sign an area development agreement that you're going to buy, build five more. With a franchisee prospective purchaser says, wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. I went and got financing for $5 million to, buy, to build five stores. Now you're telling me that if I'm going to buy those five, I have to build five more? Well, that's going to require another $5 million. And, uh, well, let's see. 
If now I need 10 million, it's changed my whole business model. Guess what they do? The prospective buyer, perhaps at the direction or suggestion of the franchisor, goes to the existing franchisee and says, listen, I would have, I was going to pay you $5 million, but now I can't. Now I can only pay you three because I need to contribute the other 2 million with another 3 million to be able to build the other five stores and then borrow the other three in order to make this whole thing work. So now what has happened, the franchisee that was selling lost $2 million. The franchisor has now obtained a, a purchaser that is going to double the size of that market from five stores to 10 stores, thus resolving the issue of increasing gross revenue in that market. The franchisee that, that just bought in is going to be encroaching upon himself or herself because they're going to be building the stores in those markets, which in turn is going to encroach on the other franchisees in the same market because now they have this market that may perhaps may be overdeveloped. And then the franchisor is going to be cutting costs and not providing the service support or assistance at the level that the individual new franchisee purchasing should get. And it becomes a snowball that frankly highlights what we all who are very experienced in this industry know as, as, as you do, uh, April, that there is a conflicting interest. Mm -hmm. There's a conflicting interest where the franchisor's objective and goal is to increase gross revenues and the franchisee's objective is to increase net income profits. Yes. And we have, I know like truly you could probably talk for 365 days, right? 24, seven, 365. And, and the entire time be giving new and more information on this industry and advice, but we don't have that much time today. The good news is that you're coming to the conference and yeah. you're going to be able to educate the franchisees and share a lot of inspiration with them there. And we'll be a returning guest on the podcast so that we can continue to, uh, to con spread this uh, wealth of knowledge with everyone. I think franchisees as well as prospective franchisees or anyone related to servicing or receiving benefit from the franchise industry should attend your swag conference because there is so much movement in the industry that's going to impact franchisees, franchisors, vendors, suppliers, people that are related to the vendors, which vendors are supplying the franchises. All of these industries are going to be substantially impacted by this new wave of companies, private equity or hedge funds coming in and investing in businesses where they don't know the business. Right. You have people that are in the, getting into the food business that were previously, that made their money in construction or vice versa. Or you have somebody who ran an airline company running a restaurant business. I mean, because you know what happens? They're looking only at numbers. In the old days of having personal relationships between franchisor and franchisee, where they said, you know what? That April Porter, what a nice franchisee. She's been there for 10 years. Now it's not April Porter. <coughs> now it's, look at unit number 1324. It's the numbers, the, the ROI, the investment, the, the metrics on the PL are not right. We got to look at that. Forget the fact that you helped create new menu items or new products or services. No, no, no. It's a new way of doing business. Now it's what do the financial metrics reflect is the input and contribution of your business to the system overall. And it's a, it's a shame because you, I mean, we've all heard this phrase before, you know, all business is really people business. That's really what business has always been built on and is the relationships and the people and the things that you're serving. And we are swinging, we are having a swing away from that now like anything, when a pendulum swings, it always swings back, but not until generally we have the fallout of the initial swing, you know, to see that it doesn't work exactly. The only way, the only way for that pendulum to swing back in a way that will provide some protection to franchisees 
is for franchisees to unify, right. to become members of franchisee associations of their own brand. And for brands that do not have franchisee associations, they need to form one. And by the way, let's be very clear. When I talk about franchisee associations, I'm not talking about franchise advisory councils. Those organizations are ineffective in terms of truly representing the franchisee's interests. You need to have a franchisee only controlled association, which will be able to set forth policies, movements, positions in, in a manner in which there's strength in unity, a strong united voice in order to explain to the franchise or that the boots on the ground, the franchisees who are best connected to what's happening in the real world, believe that there is a business case that opposes the new policies or procedures that they want to implement in their system. Yeah. And a great way to get started in understanding all of this again is to attend the SWAG conference, because not only are you going to be getting education on the industry and what's happening and all these different things, but it is truly an opportunity to network with other franchisees in other brands and other industries and you know, what's going on what's going on for them, what have they experienced, and, and get a sense of, you know, could that happen to me? How could I prepare? Maybe it's something you've never thought of before. So that's another benefit. So, well, thank you so much for your time today, Zarko. As always, it is such a pleasure to talk to you and to learn from you. And we are so honored and excited to have you as our keynote speaker at the conference. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. And let everyone know that uh, after I speak at these conferences, I'm going to be there. I'm going to walk around. I'll be, I'm, I'm very open, you know, to talk to anyone about their issues because I'm there to try to educate. Uh, and it's an opportunity to get me for free uh, while at that conference. So uh, I encourage everyone that is listening to this to attend, to tell their friends, to tell their colleagues, to tell their fellow franchisees. There is a tremendous amount to learn and you don't want to be that one that stayed home and later has to be told you should have been there. You're not going to believe it. Today I'm being kind of mellow and relaxed. You know, I'm doing this in my office. Uh, I'm a, a dynamic speaker and I get really into it. The more, the bigger the crowd, the more dynamic I get. And I promise there's a tremendous amount of information that I will impart to everyone that uh, attends to make, to help make, what will already be a wonderful conference, even more wonderful, productive, and uh, full of knowledge um, and information. So if you want more information on the SWAG conference, just check out the show notes and uh, we will see um, those of you that get in first. We'll see you there. My name is April Porter. Welcome. We are changing the franchising industry. Show up every day authentically as yourself, unapologetically to infinite success.